There's been several times uh, in my life that as I'm heading out the door to help a friend, my wife looks at me and says, why are you wearing those clothes? You should change. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go help him a little bit. And she goes, no, you're not. You're going to get dirty. You're going you're gonna to mess your clothes up. You know better than that. And she's right. I have a tendency. I'm not, I said, I'm just going to go hold the shovel. I'm not going to hold the shovel. I'm going to end up helping him dig and I'm going to get dirty and I'm going to get sweaty and there are clothes that are appropriate for certain tasks and clothes that are appropriate for other situations. And as Paul's going to say here in chapter 12, for you as a believer, there's some things that in reality are never appropriate for you because you are a believer in Christ. And there are other things that are appropriate for you to put on. We've been looking here in Romans 12 and 13 about how we can play a positive role in believers becoming stable. And one of the things he says is to recognize that my, your salvation, my salvation, is nearer than the day I believe. That is, my salvation being full and complete, finished, got everything God promised in total, that that's done. And so he says in verse 12, the night is almost gone or far advanced and the day is coming near. That is when I'm going to get it. Therefore, let us rid ourselves, this word rid in the New American Standard is this word to put off. And I think it's a better way to go because it it plays off this word to put on down here. So put off the deeds of darkness. That is, there's words that we're going to understand darkness a little bit better in a minute, but there's deeds that you should put off because they're not appropriate to who you are. They do not reflect who you are as a child of God with this absolute full great salvation that is getting closer. I've got some of it, but I'm waiting for a lot of it yet in the future. And then he says to put on. So now I'm putting on other clothing. I've taken off this clothing because it's not appropriate to who I am. And I'm putting on this clothing, this armor, these implements, which goes back to chapter 12 here in Romans, where he said in verse 11 that we died with Christ to the sin nature and now are living ones to God in Christ. So he says, therefore, do not let the sin nature, I'll put a link down below, to our studies earlier where we talked through this verse, these verses on the sin nature. Do not let the sin nature reign in your mortal body so that you should obey its cravings. Don't do that. And do not go on presenting then the members of your body. The members are, yeah, these implements, but it's also your spirit, it's your soul, it's, it's your mind. It's, just, it's more than just physical things. Don't present these members of, of your body here or your members uh, as tools or instruments there's our word, hoplot, instruments, tools for accomplishing something uh, of unrighteousness. But, same language that he uses in 12.1 where he says, present your body. He says, but present yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead. Because he said back in verse 11, we rose with Christ. We were made alive with Christ. And your members as instruments, same word down here, hopla again, as instruments of righteousness to God. You can present these and say, God, you can use these. You can accomplish something through this. Now we go back over here and he calls them the armor instruments or, or tools of light. Go back over here to John 1 and we go to verse 4 as he's talking about the Word, who is the second person of the Godhead, the way we popularly talk about him. He says, in him was life. He, he came down here. And he had eternal life. And his eternal life was the light of men. What does it mean it was light of men? Well, it was a light that shines in, a dark, in darkness. In other words, he just didn't have eternal life and sit around twiddle his thumb. He did stuff. He exercised. He used that eternal life. And people could see it. It was like somebody turned a light on and they could clearly see eternal life. And guess what? He made the promise in chapter 8. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world and he who follows me now, this word follows is not, does not really apply to you and I. That was for those people who were his disciples at that time, and they were following him while he walked the earth. And he was promising them, and he does this, you can look at this at the uh, Mark chapter 10 and verse 30, that in the coming age, they would get eternal life. So he follows me, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light that consists of life. In other words, he was promising them that we, they would get eternal life. And like his, like the eternal life that he lived out, it would be light. When they used it, people could see it. They could see what it did. Understand that? So when he's saying over here that we put on the armor of light, 
he's really saying that we're putting on the tools, the implements that demonstrate or live out before other people eternal life in activity, like Jesus Christ came down here and lived out eternal life before other people. You and I can do the same and put that on. That's appropriate to who we are. Carrying on in the deeds of darkness is not appropriate. So he's going to kind of, just to kind of throw this back and forth illustration, he says, so let's behave properly. Interesting of this properly is a word for that which is, is like a good scenery. In other words, our life, they ought to see something good in the way they see it. Uh, so we're operating in the day. So we're looking forward to, the, to this daytime, this time of light in which we're always going to live as God wants, not in carousing or partying, wild partying, and not in drunkenness. They're inappropriate for us. Not in, and let, let me stop because I want to make some comments here about the fact that when he says things like this, people sometimes, we, we run off because we just can't imagine that Christians do this kind of stuff. But you know what? Paul had spent three years with the Ephesians. They knew a lot of stuff that a lot of Christians never learn. And yet when he wrote the Ephesian letter to them, he had to tell them in Ephesians 5.18, in the Greek, stop being drunk with wine. He had to tell believers to not get drunk. Yes, he was having to tell them to not be drunk. It's not just he's saying, don't go off and get drunk. He's actually telling them, knock it off, guys. It's not the way you should be. So somebody in that church or some bodies in that church were doing that. Yeah, Christians do these things. And not in sexual promiscuity. You know what? When Paul wrote the Corinthians, and yeah, the Corinthians is loaded with problems, but in chapter 6, he had to tell the men in the church, quit visiting prostitutes. If I had to get up on Sunday at church and tell the men in my church to quit doing that, good heavens, you'd wonder, if you were visiting, you'd wonder, what in the world's wrong with this church? Well, even back then, you look at Corinthian, the Corinthian church and you go, what was wrong with these people? It's just because you're a Christian and saved doesn't necessarily mean that you do everything the way it's supposed to be. It doesn't mean that you always do God's will. And so he says, stop doing that. And then this word debauchery is also a word for sexual immorality, but it's a word like, I'm in your face and I don't care what you think about it. It's your problem. And I will parade my sexual promiscuity all over the place. Kind of is the idea of that. And then not in strife. Boy, even if Christians are in churches, like I grew up in churches and people, to my knowledge, were not running around being sexually promiscuous and they were not being drunk, but people argued. That's what strife is. It's argument, argumentativeness. And jealousy, which is actually technically in the Greek, it's the word zealos for zeal. And it's that negative kind of zeal where you'll run right over the top of people to achieve your goals. Because you getting your goals and winning is more important than them. And he says, what does he say there? Our, our way of life should not be these kind of things. What should our way of life be? Remember he said, put off the works of darkness? Well, he, he gave us just kind of a three pairs here of things that, not these things. Those are some examples. But what's appropriate? He says, put on the armor or the tools of light. Put on here again, same word, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells us over here in Galatians chapter 3 that if you've been baptized into Christ, and that's not water baptism, this is what happened when you believed the gospel and the Spirit put you into Christ. You didn't know it. I, I was 20, about 20 years old the first time I learned that I was put into Christ. I probably heard the, put, the in Christ language, but I didn't really know what this meant. But you were baptized or put into Christ and you have clothed or put on Christ. In other words, when you became a son of God in Christ, God clothed you over with Christ like your garment of maturity, your garment that marks you as part of his family and a citizen in his family. And so he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision, no forethought, no being mindful ahead of time of the flesh that you should do its lusts. It's amazing that Paul has to say this 
But it's as though we go back to verse 1 of chapter 12 where he tells them, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And it's as though some of those believers were saying, okay, here I am, God. You can use me. You've got me for the next three or four hours. And then I got this other thing I just assume not talk about that I'm going to go do. Because I'm going to go off and go back through those things up there. I'm going to a crazy wild party. Or I'm going to go get drunk. Or I'm going to go maybe be immoral. Or I'm probably going to engage in some fights and argumentativeness. Or I've got to pursue my goal and I've got to win this thing. Whoever gets in my way, they better watch out. He says, don't do that. Don't make forethought. The very fact that Paul has to say this suggests to us that sometimes as believers, when we want God to use us and present and we present ourselves to God to use us, that sometimes we're doing that thinking, well, later today, I've got other things I'm going to do. <laughs> and by other things, we mean things we know that are inconsistent with who we are in Christ. And the whole purpose of this, and I realize this study is a little bit longer today, but the whole purpose of kind of keeping all this together is to help us think through the fact that there are things that are appropriate to who we are in Christ and things that are inappropriate. This is kind of what Paul tells us in Titus uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and following, that this is how grace trains us as children. It shows us that there's things that are consistent with his grace and things that don't reflect his grace. Things that reflect his grace are things that line up with who God says we are in Christ and the salvation God's given. Things that are inconsistent or things that they don't reflect that great, gracious salvation. And are both saved completely? Yes. Do both have exactly the same future? Yes. But sometimes we're living this way and it is completely inappropriate. We should be living a life in which it looks as though we're wearing Christ, as Paul says here in verse 14. And that's something that we can be encouraging both ourselves as well as those that lack stability to be doing, not to earn points with God, not to earn a better future, but simply to glorify God right now. And in doing that, we're encouraging those people as well as ourselves to have a good day in the Lord. I'm Pastor Tim Holsher. And I hope that this study that kind of challenges the way we think about the Christian life a little bit has been helpful to you today. Thank you for joining me.